Hi, and welcome to Microbiology. My name is Lisa Back, and I will be talking with you today about our microbial world. Bringing you this information this way is not my preferred way. I would rather have you all sitting in the classroom and that we can have this dialogue happening instead of me speaking to you out there just wondering um, exactly how you're taking this in. But I hope you find this topic as fascinating as I do. I would like to tell you all that um, my own experience, I was in infectious disease for about 15 years at the University of Virginia and I realized that we really do live in a microbial world and we're only able to live here because of the microbes that we live with. Many of you probably think of yourselves as being human, um, but I more accurately think of you as being only about 10 percent human because for every one human cell that we have, we have 10 microbial organisms that live in and on us for every one human cell we have. They are tiny um, compared to our large cells, but cell to cell, they still way outnumber us. If we think about life on this planet and how life actually exists, it, it exists because of a very special molecule called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid that holds all the information for all the processes that go on at a cellular level. And when we think of that, what we will see then is that actually in our human cells, we have about 30,000 genes or recipes that make up our traits found on our DNA molecule. But if we look at all of the diversity of the microbes that live in and on us and that they're outnumbering us 10 to 1, there are 100 times more genes and traits being processed on those microbes than, than we have. So at best, we're about 10% human, but in more of a reality type of situation, we're about 1% human. Again, we live in a microbial world. These organisms are allowing us to live in a state of health, and when that balance is disturbed, then we're going to see that some of them can actually act as pathogens. This course is designed to um, to actually concentrate on the organisms that we consider to be pathogenic. A pathogen is anything that can cause harm or, or get you out of a state of balance or health. But we have to keep in mind always, always, that, that really most of the microbes are just allowing us to survive. We need them. Without them and without them in the proper balance, we don't get to be healthy. So we definitely live in a microbial world. I hope you are ex as excited as I am about us um, taking this journey together. Again, I wish I was seeing you in the classroom. Please um, forgive me if I'm having to refer to notes or whatnot, but I'm going to try to give you all the highlights for these lectures. These lecture recordings, anything that I say on these could be on the quiz, a little lecture quiz, which will be about 10 questions. Um, to take after taking notes from this this particular topic you would also want to go to your student learning outcomes and objectives and make sure for chapter one that you could answer any of those objectives because that those will be on the test when the te when tests eventually happen but for the lecture it's just going to be what I lecture quiz will be just what we talk about something that I think is um, hopefully you'll find as interesting as I do, is that when we think about these microbes and just exactly what the microorganisms are doing and how tiny they are, what we realize is that even though they really are tiny and you think how can something size-wise, our human cells are large compared to a microorganism, but how can something so tiny overwhelm human cellular processes? And what we found out is that microbes are communicating with each other. The way that they do that is by sending out little signals so that they know how many of them are in that particular location or environment. And they stay under our immune system radar until there's enough of them. And then they turn on their virulence factors, things that can make them pathogenic. So as long as they're in a state of balance and there's not too many of them happening, they don't make us sick. But once there's a, a lot of them present, then they can overwhelm our immune system defenses, and this is how they cause disease. I wanted to give you an example 
of how we know that this happens, this communication between microbes, not just within their own species, but between species. And it's actually referred to as quorum sensing. Um, let me explain what happens. What you are looking at here is actually a squid, a squid that's found in the Hawaiian Islands. This squid actually lives in very shallow, shallow waters off the Hawaiian coast, and it feeds at night. At night, it comes out in these very shallow waters, and it and it is like surveying the bottom of the of the ocean for its prey. But as you can imagine, as it's surveying the bottom of the ocean for its prey prey, the moon is causing it to cast a shadow on the bottom of the ocean. So the prey is alerted. If you saw a big shadow, all of a sudden you're outside and, and, and something covers the sun, you would probably look up to see what it had been. Well, the, the prey is doing that with this predator squid as it's creating a shadow. So a microorganism, uh, a bacterium called Vibrio, has actually evolved with this squid and on the bottom surface of the squid there is this pouch on its belly that during the daytime when the squid is asleep this pouch, this bacteria is multiplying in this pouch like area of the squid and as it's multiplying growing in numbers it actually waits until there's enough of them present and then all of a sudden in the evening when there's enough of them present a light turns on. It has a gene that's called bioluminescence. So at nighttime, the bacteria in this sack, belly sack of the squid is actually lit up. So it acts, this squid acts like a stealth bomber of the ocean. It can actually, on the top part of it, its back, it can sense how much moonlight is present. And then it can shudder its belly lit up area so that it doesn't cast a, a shadow. Its prey doesn't know that it's coming over it, and it's allowed to, it can eat because of that. And it has, co this bacteria, a bacterium has co-evolved with the squid. At the, in the early morning, when it's finished feeding, this squid can eject all of the microbes that are inside of its little gut that has been, that have been dividing. And as they are ejected out of the sac, they disperse throughout the water and they no longer have bioluminescence. The, the bacterium only turns on the bioluminescence gene when there's enough of them present. And then we have to ask ourselves, how do they know when there's enough of them present? Well, how they know when there's enough of them present is by um, sensing how many are in the environment by creating molecules and dispersing those molecules for, to their neighbors. So anyway, just to, just to that was an F, all of that was FYI about the quorum sensing, but I just wanted you to know that this is how we know that they can overcome our own defenses. We, many of us carry Streptococcus, for example, Streptococcus pyogenes in our throat, but it's a tiny little bacterium, it's a tiny microbe, and it usually doesn't cause us any trouble as long as there's low numbers of it. But once the numbers start to get overwhelming, it can then turn on virulence factors factors that cause incredible inflammation and disease in our throats, but also can harm other areas of our body. We'll talk more about that later. So when you think about um, microbes and how they're allowing us to live, many of the microorganisms that live in and on us can never cause us disease and they won't cause us disease. And we would like to have a lot of those. We would like to have enough numbers of those present in our mouths and on our GI tract and on our skin that they are keeping the potential pathogens in low numbers. So this is what we're kind of hoping for. We get introduced to microorganisms as soon as the amniotic sac breaks, the water breaks, and the fetus is now being exposed to the microbes in the mother's vagina. And as that fetus moves through the vagina, even more microorganisms are, are being introduced to the fetus. And the, the fetus is now going to become colonized with these microbes. These microbes teach our immune systems what is friendly and what is foe. That They serve a vital role in that. One of the microbes in the vagina is called lactobacillus. Lactobacillus acidophilus is the species. This bacteria actually is going to be introduced into the uh, oral cavity of the fetus, swallowed, and it's going to establish in the colon 
of the fetus and help the fetus to be able to process milk. Uh, again, the bacteria that's that, that does that is called lactobacillus acidophilus. Um, and then we also have microbes that are helping us to process vitamins. Just because we ingest something doesn't mean that we're going to be able to absorb it or that we're going to be able to use it. Sometimes it comes out the other end absolutely unchanged. But it's because of our microorganisms that are predominating in our large intestines, our colon, that allow for that finishing process of nutrition to happen and absorption. Um, we have microbes that we now can use in the laboratory to be our agents of producing many different antibiotics. We can produce human insulin. We have the human, the gene, the recipe for human insulin can be inserted into microbes through genetic engineering. And we have these microorganisms, as long as we're feeding them, they will make human insulin for us all day long. And that's just one example. We also have microbes making things like clotting factors for, for people who have hemophilia. And again, we know certain microbes that love what we call pollution, but to them, it's their meal, it's their food, and they, they will gobble up pollutants like oil spills in the Gulf and, and in Alaska and wherever they happen. They'll gobble up the oil and they'll put out into the environment simple compounds such as carbon dioxide and water. So um, bioremediation is this idea that we can use microorganisms to help us clean up our environment. And then last but not least on this list is that many of our foods, certainly cheeses, breads, wines, beers, we use microorganisms to help us to produce those foods. As far as life on this planet, life on this planet has, um, the planet itself is approximately, the planet itself is approximately 4.6 billion years old. But we have shown, it's been proven, that life on this planet has been around for approximately 3.8 billion years. So it's been around for a long time. Of course, the early life on this planet was not what we think of today, the warm, fuzzy, and, and cozy creatures that we think of today. It was simple, single-cell life forms. So the simplest single-cell life forms started many billions of years ago, three point, approximately 3.8 billion years ago. And now from the earliest life on this planet, evolution has happened and speciation has occurred. And so now today, the millions of species that are present today on this planet have evolved from what were the earliest life species on this planet we know that in this, these billions of years that life has been on this planet, there have been five major extinction events where as many as 90% of all the species present at that particular time became extinct. And then new speciation occurred from those remaining species that, that were left behind during those extinction events. There's been more than 20 minor extinction events, but again, five major extinction events that have happened that we have lost up to 90% of the species that were present. Kind of what we see is that there's nothing so far that has happened as far as extinction events that have occurred that have, have wiped out all life, that it had to start again. Some things have remained and stayed behind. Today, we can kind of think about the species that are present today on this planet. We wouldn't even be here if it hadn't been for those extinction events. Who knows how, how life would have evolved without those prior extinction events. When we think about microbiology and just how it is defined, it's certainly biology means the study of life, ology is the study of bio meaning life. Microbiology would be the study of the living organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye. So when we think about things that are too small to be seen with the naked eye, certainly bacteria come to mind. A group of, of organisms, and some of you may not have heard of these, called archaea bacteria, are also um, things that we think about. These organisms, this, this domain, if you will, or kingdom, these organisms live in very extreme environments. Um, these are single-celled organisms that we have found living in um, incredibly hot 
environments like volcanic vents, incredibly salty environments like the Dead Sea, which we had thought at one point was um, devoid of any live species, but we know archaeobacteria um, are existing there. Then more complex single-celled organisms called protozoa and even fungi. And helminths belong to the animal kingdom. Helminths are what we think a lot of people call parasites, such as worms or flukes. So um, we understand that there are many different microorganism categories, and we are certainly going to concentrate on the ones that are pathogenic. Again, a pathogen is any type of microbe that can cause disease, and there are many different ones, but as far as the scheme of things go, there's just a handful because most of them are going to be beneficial to humans, things that we can use and things that we absolutely need to stay healthy. So um, when we think about infectious diseases I, and why we study this, it is important to understand that in our country we have really been brought up with sort of, especially people living today, um, have been brought up with a really kind of skewed view about infectious diseases because we take for granted the health care in this country. Even people that um, really don't have insurance or whatever usually are going to have some place that they can go to if there's a, an imminent risk of an infectious disease and they can get treated. But what we need to understand as far as the world population goes, um, the United States is only 5% of the population. And so for us to think about infectious diseases still being the most common cause of disease, it's hard for us to realize that. But the number one cause of, of death in children under five years old, this is just, just an example, is actually going to be um, diarrhea and dehydration. For us, that's hard to get our heads around because we understand that if, if a child is, is having chronic diarrhea from a virus or from a bacterium or whatever, then we can go to hospitals and, and we can get our, our children put on IVs until they can get through whatever the infectious process was. But the fact is that there's nothing more deadly to a human being than an infectious disease. There is no other diseases that we know that can be as rapidly devastating to a human body as an infectious disease. No one is going to be diagnosed with diabetes today and die from it this evening in your ER. No one is going to uh, have typically find out they have cancer and within hours be gone after the diagnosis. No, those are much slower metabolic types of situations. But an infectious disease can truly do that. An infectious disease can take a young, healthy person in the prime of their life, if they get exposed to this infectious agent, this infectious microbe, that person can be dead within minutes or hours. So, as I said, um, infectious diseases can be the most devastating diseases that we know in mankind. And so we really do, especially people who are going in to health science fields, they really need to have a good understanding, not to be, not so that it frightens them or whatever, but just a good respect of what some of these more common infectious diseases disease agents are because some of them are communicable and some of them are not. But either way, um, you need to know what your patient's dealing with. You need to be thinking about whether this is something that is going to be um, devastating for this patient, how quickly the signs and symptoms may come about, what you're going to do to treat. With that thought in mind, I really do want you to understand that in this class, I am going to emphasize a couple of things throughout the, the session. And what I'm going to emphasize is that when you think about an infectious disease, you're thinking about first what category it belongs to. Is it a bacterium? Is it a bacterium? Or is it a eukaryote? Is it going to be a bacteria or is it going to fall into this category that we call eukaryotes that are more complex organisms? Um, the kingdoms that fall into eukaryotic organisms are protozoa, fungi, plants, and animals. Now, protozoa can be pathogenic and they are single cells, so they're microscopic. Fungi can be microscopic. They can also be macroscopic, where we can see them, but fungi that we think about as pathogens are microscopic. And then it can also belong to, they can belong to categories of 
hominins, which are parasites that belong in the animal kingdom. Many of the parasites, worms and whatnot, you can see them with your naked eye, many of them. But their infectious stages are actually eggs and larvae, which are microscopic. And this is why we include them in our study of microbiology. As far as the domain and kingdom of archaea bacteria, or archaea, this domain, there are no real pathogens that we think about in this domain for humans. And so I, while I want you to know that it is one of the three major domains, and it's a kingdom all by itself, archaea, sometimes referred to as archaeobacteria. These microorganisms we're really not going to study as far as um, pathogenicity for them because none of them are included in our human pathogens. So, moving along, bacteria. Um, a bacteria again. Make sure we understand our predominant, our single-celled organisms. Eukaryotic organisms are usually multicellular, but some can be single-celled, like the protozoa, and also some fungi. Eukaryotes, another um, distinction between eukaryotes and archaea and bacteria are that eukaryote, if we break that word down, eukaryotes, eu means true, eu means true, kary means nucleus, um, so these are, are organisms that have a true nucleus. Bacteria and archaea belong to a group called prokaryotes, which means before, pro, before a nucleus. So they are tiny, they are much smaller, they are much more simple in their life needs, if you will, and they don't have any kinds of organelles. Um, they are very, very simple in their life processes where the eukaryotes not only have a true nucleus, they have other organelles like mitochondria that we know are going to be the organelles where energy or ATP molecule is going to be made, chloroplasts, which are organelles that are going to be used for making their own food for photosynthetic organisms. So, so these are the three domains that we talk about in microbiology. You all, maybe many of you, learned, instead of learning domains, you learned about kingdoms, the six kingdoms. So I would want you to understand that archaea is one kingdom, bacteria is one kingdom, and then of the eukaryotes, you learned four kingdoms. Those kingdoms were proteist, fungi, plant, and animal. So that would be just sort of an organizational type of thing for you to kind of understand. Some of you might be thinking about, well, what about viruses? Because aren't they infectious? Well, certainly they are infectious, but viruses are not considered to be alive. A virus is considered to be a perfect obligate parasite. Obligate parasite means that they must live inside of a living host cell before they can actually replicate. Viruses are not considered life forms. They're considered to be either active or inactive. When they are active, it means that they are inside of a living host cell and they sometimes are wreaking havoc inside of that living host cell. And when they are inactive, it means that they are still there, but they are, they're existing typically outside of the host cell. Some viruses can live for a long time on um, surfaces outside of a host cell. Some can't live very long at all. So when we start talking about different viruses, sometimes that's an important thing to know. Like how long can a virus live on inanimate surfaces? I would like for you to be introduced to um, someone who is considered to be the father of microbiology. And so you would certainly want to know that that's, his, that's sort of the name that we give him in microbiology. And this is Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur is known as the father of microbiology because he actually um, is the one that finally with his experiments gave us the understanding that all life on this planet comes from pre-existing cellular life. And so that, that concept is what we call the cell theory, scientific theory called the cell theory, is that all life on this planet comes from pre-existing cellular life. 
and that the cell is the smallest thing on this planet that has properties of life. So um, those two premises of the cell theory would be something that you know you really want to be familiar with, but also an understanding that Louis Pasteur with his work and his experiments actually um, gave us the cell theory or finally put the theory of spontaneous generation to rest. That theory stated that life came from non-existing life, that life could just spring up from inanimate surfaces um, or structures. So from hay you could get mice, from um, freshly cut meat, meat you could get flies, you know, whatever. So that's what that um, the cell theory actually put to rest. And what we know now is that life doesn't happen on this planet as we know it now. Life does not happen unless it came from pre-existing cellular life. In other words, we all have parents, don't we? And our parents have parents and their parents have parents and going way, way back. Same thing though with not just eukaryotic organisms such as us, but also prokaryotic organisms like bacteria. Bacteria don't just spring up. There has to have been one there first. The, the unique thing about, about bacteria that's very different from eukaryotes is that bacteria only takes one organism to divide and make two copies of itself. Um, complex organisms such as us, we can't do that. We, we require partners, right? Sexual reproduction. But with bacteria, they can definitely reproduce with just one single organism after 20 divisions can you can have a million organisms that were identical to the first one. Now this all seems a little bit overwhelming and I'm sure and hopefully not though but anyway what I'd like to um, tell you in this little introduction this brief introduction is that to keep it all organized what we need to be thinking about is how we classify these organisms. So I've given you three domains. Those th domains of living organisms on these, this planet are bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. So we know there are three domains. We know that there's three domains. There are actually six kingdoms that we think about, and I had named those for you. Again, the archaea, the bacteria, proteist, fungi, plant, and animals. And then when we're thinking about microbes, in particular microorganisms, we have a naming process that Carl Linnaeus, or you'll see here that, that another version of that European is Carl Linnaeus, but uh, or you'll sometimes see Carlos Linnaeus. But anyway, Carl Linnaeus, this, this um, person gave us this classifying system called the binomial nomenclature. Binomial means two names. So when we think about this, we think about the first name being the genus name and the second name being the species name. Um, and this really helped to organize how scientists who were working with these different organisms and identifying them and discovering these organisms all kind of got on the same page as far as the naming of these organisms. And so now um, this really helped to speed up our, our collection of information about these microbes. So how do we actually, how we actually um, write these organisms names is again with genus first and then species. So an example of this, I've already mentioned Streptococcus that some people have in their, carry around in their throat and oral cavity. There are many different species of Streptococcus. Streptococcus is a genus. So you would write always write genus name with a capital letter. So Streptococcus would be um, starting with the capital S, Streptococcus. And then the species name is always in lowercase. The first letter is always in lowercase. So again, there, there are many species of Streptococcus we're going to be introduced to. The one that causes strep throat is called Streptococcus pyogenes. Um, and so maybe you wouldn't know how to write it. After the first time, that you speak about an organism, its genus and species, you can often abbreviate the, the genus with just the first letter. So like S pyogenes is how you would say that. Many of you have heard of a bacterium called E, E coli. Uh, I think many of the, you've probably all heard that. There was recently an outbreak of some lettuce and whatnot with E coli that they recall. 
uh, that was that actually did was responsible for a couple of deaths that caused a lot of people to be sick. What that E stands for is Escherichia. Escherichia is the genus name. Coli is the species name. Um, but more people are familiar with it by just calling it E. Coli. So this has been a very quick little lecture recording of our introduction to micro. I hope that you guys are excited about this as much as I am. I will be trying to make these very abbreviated lectures. The lecture quiz will only come from uh, questions will only come from things that I have actually said out loud on these lecture recordings. But make sure that you are always going to your textbook and reading the chapters and especially answering the questions that you will see in those objectives for the chapters because anything that's in those objectives including what I've said on lecture recordings can be in the tests that come um, to you later in the semester, the unit tests, and there are going to be four of those. So there will not be any questions on those tests, which are going to be all multiple choice by the way, the unit tests. Um, there will not be anything that wouldn't have been found if you'd answered the, the learning objectives and you listened to these recordings. So anyway, best wishes to you guys. I am going to look forward to, to speaking with you, even though in this kind of weird artificial setting where I'm in my office talking to myself. But anyway, um, I hope you know that I'll be available to you through email, and um, I look forward to working with you.